pretty powerful story here in Numbers chapter 16. And oftentimes on Sundays I'll preach topical sermons and, and things that are applicable or things that are going on currently or whatever. But this morning it's going to be a little bit more of an expository type of sermon. It just means it's going to be more similar to a, a Wednesday night Bible study. We're going to be going through this story verse by verse. There are so many things that we can learn from this one story and we're definitely not going to have time to get into all of it because there's so much but one of the things that just kind of sticks out to me and stuck out to me out preparing for my sermon is just how important this is now um Korah is a false prophet Korah is listed in the book of Jude and um in the New Testament, it calls his name Cori. It's just a different spelling of Korah. But if you read the book of Jude, you'll see that it's all about false prophets and identifying them, how you know certain men crept in unawares, and they were they're wicked men and they're trying to deceive. And we have an example of this in the old we have many examples of this. Jesus taught about, you know, beware of false prophets that bring in damnable heresy. And he told them, you'll know them by their fruits. And um, there's, you know, the Apostle Paul warned of grievous wolves coming in that won't spare the flock. This is a theme throughout Scripture that we cannot ignore. We have stories, we have warnings, and we're going to take some time this morning and just go through this chapter and see what we could learn because what happens as a result, there's a lot of destruction. A lot of people end up dying. And I would say this core was probably, it was definitely a very powerful false prophet. As we'll see a little bit later, we already read the whole chapter. He was so convincing that even after the earth swallowed up Korah and his entire family, that is obviously a miracle. It's not something that can be done. They still were mad at Moses saying, you killed the people of God. We'll get into that later in the sermon. But, but this is how much he had the people brainwashed. This is how powerful this false prophet was. God opens up the earth to swallow him up and the people are mad at Moses. But we're also going to see another thing in this chapter, and it's how a real man of God behaves himself, how his focus should be, the care and the intercession for the people, even when they're against him. We're going to see all these things. Let's jump in. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but I want you to just be aware and thinking about all these different points because they're extremely powerful and well uh, spelled out in this passage. Look at verse number one. The Bible says, Now Korah, the son of Izhar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, and Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, and On, the son of Peleth, sons of Reuben, took men. So it starts off by basically separating Korah from the rest of these guys that are causing discord and causing problems in the camp because Korah is of the tribe of the Levites. Dathan, Abiram, and on are basically of the tribe of Reuben. So they're not of the priest, they're not of, the, of, of any portion of service to the Lord. In the Old Testament, God separated the Levites in order to do the service of the Lord. At this time, they have the tabernacle set up and any, everybody in the tribe of Levi was supposed to do some sort of service. They're supposed to be setting up the tabernacle, you know, performing sacrifices, doing all these different things. And then you have the priesthood, which is Aaron and Moses and, and you know, Aaron's sons, and they perform the office of the priest. So that's the way that God set up the structure. Now we have Korah, which is just one of the Levites, teamed up with Dathan, Abiram, and On. And it says here in verse number two, and they rose up before Moses with certain of the children of Israel, 250 princes of the assembly, famous in the congregation, men of renown. So they joined themselves with these very famous, powerful princes or leaders within the children of Israel. Men of influence, people who are looked up to, people who are respected, people who are in positions of power, they gather together 250 people and just pit them against Moses. Because when you have these, these powerful, influential people, now they're in, able to influence even that much more people below them that look up to these men, the men of renown. Verse number three says, And they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron and said unto them, Ye take too much upon you seeing all the congregation are holy. 
every one of them. And the Lord is among them. Wherefore, then lift ye up yourselves above the congregation of the Lord. Now, what we see here is a rebellion. Yeah. It's a rebellious heart, rebellious attitude. And what are they doing? They're coming against Moses. They're coming against Aaron. Now, what are Moses and Aaron doing? They're trying to serve God. They're trying to help the people. They're trying to lead the people. They've set up the tabernacle. These people have already seen the miracles of God, how God led them out of Egypt. Moses was the man leading them that God was using to lead them out. And to have the, this lack of respect for the leadership, for Moses especially, and for Aaron, to just be like, ah, oh, you're taking too much on you. Taking too much on you? How can you say that to the guy who led the children of Israel through the Red Sea? How can you say that to the guy that's been leading them through the wilderness, communicating with the Lord, receiving the commandments of God? I mean, it literally says in the Bible that, that the face of Moses was shining because when he met with God, he met with them as a friend meets with a friend face to face, the Bible says. And the glory of the Lord which is the brightness, the shining, filled the tabernacle when God was present there and Moses would go in and receive commandments from the Lord. And because Moses was there with God, communing with God, that glory kind of rubbed off on him so that when he left, his face was literally shining and it scared the people and they couldn't handle it. And he had to put a veil over his face in order to go back and relay all the messages from the Lord unto the people and then take the veil off when he went and talked to God. This is that same Moses. Oh, you're taking too much upon yourself. What about us? What they're saying. What, what about this whole congregation? We're all holy. We're all saved. This, is, this would be the modern day. Well, what makes you think that you should be pastor of the church? What makes you think that you should lead these people? I mean, we're all saved here. We're all brothers and sisters in Christ. So why don't I just get up and lead? Why don't you, this person get up? And lead? Why doesn't they go, who do you think you are? Amen. This is the attitude. But unfortunately, this attitude, it might resonate with some people going, yeah, yeah, hey, who do they think they are? Yeah, yeah, we should get up there too. Yeah, let's hear all these different opinions. Yeah, well, I would have to listen to you. And in so doing, just completely ignore Scripture and what God's Word actually says. In this case, they're just ignoring that God ordained that the, the, the Aaron and his children should be the priests. And these people wanted to have the job of the priest. These people want to take over this job that God has already ordained men to do. Modern day, the Bible lays out who should be a pastor, that there are qualifications, there are rules. Read the book of Titus, chapter 1. You read uh, 1 Timothy. Read these, read these books and see what the Bible says about who should be leading a church and the qualifications given there. They're there for a reason. That's right. That's right. While, yes, we are all brothers and sisters in Christ, everyone who's born again is a child of God, amen. I'm not saying anyone is better than another, but there are definitely different roles. They're different positions, and this, this concept comes up frequently. I've preached on this multiple times. This church is a body. The body has different members. There's different parts. In order to function properly, everybody needs to be in their place where God wants them to be. Not everybody's going to be the eye or the ear or the hand or the foot. Or, you know, we need to have all those parts. We need to have all of those members, and people need to be joined together. But what we have here is a bunch of people who are... Um, just looking to have that one position, the position of the leadership, the position where all the eyes are upon them, and they're trying to tear down. And ultimately, these are wicked people. That's right, yeah. They don't care about the things of God. They care about themselves. And this is what, how wicked people operate. This is how false prophets operate. They're wolves in sheep's clothing. They don't care about the people. In fact, they go to, to, to seek and to destroy. And that's the warning that we get. And the reason why I believe this warning comes out so much is because for most normal people, it's a very difficult concept to grasp. And it's something we need to be reminded of over and over again because you think, as a normal person, I don't wake up thinking, who am I going to hurt today? 
how can I get into mischief and how can I cause problems and how can I split churches and how can I hurt people? That's probably not how anyone in this room thinks. At least I hope not. But the book of Proverbs tells us about the people who don't sleep unless they're getting into some kind of mischief. The Bible talks in many places about wicked people who are just bent on destruction. So we have to believe by faith these people exist. They're real. So we need to be aware of this. We need to, to, to be able to respond appropriately and just not be naive. Not be naive into thinking that everybody that opens up their mouth claiming the word of the Lord is a good person. Not everybody that just says, oh yeah, I believe the Bible and I believe in Jesus is a good person. There's many people that use the name of Christ and abuse the name in order to just hurt people, get money for themselves, whatever it is that, that the false prophets want for themselves, they don't care about the people. Korah, Nathan, Dathan, and Byram, they didn't care about the people at all. They didn't care about the congregation. They cared about themselves. They didn't care about the goal, getting into the land of Canaan. They didn't care about those things. They just said, well, who are you? It says here, you take too much upon you, seeing all the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Wherefore, then lift ye up yourselves above the congregation of the Lord. And notice, they're twisting the truth. They're lying. Did Moses lift up himself? Or Aaron lift up himself? No. Moses didn't wake up one day and just be like, you know what, I'm going to go and I'm going to strive to be this great leader and get all these people to follow me and I'm going to start my own religion and we're going to leave Egypt and I'm going to do all this stuff. That's not what Moses was thinking. God called Moses. God ordained Moses and said, this is what you're going to do, Moses. And he didn't even really want to do it. He said, well, I can't speak really well, God. I can't, you know, I don't know if I could do this. And it's not that he didn't want to do it, but he, just, he wasn't confident. He wasn't sure of himself. He's saying, can you help me out here? Can you, you know, and that's when God provided Aaron for him to be the mouthpiece. But it wasn't Moses, it wasn't Aaron that lifted up themselves and going, well, we're the bosses here and we're going to tell you what to do. These people were leading based on the instruction of the Lord. Very plain and simple. There's so many attacks just in these first few verses against the, the leadership, against Moses, against Aaron. And as I mentioned before, this is just indicative of the overall lack of respect they had for Moses. And this attitude of disrespect is in full force today. People who just don't care about church, don't care about pastors, don't care about leadership at all. And just want to think that, well, what do I need you for? I could just read the Bible and have the Holy Spirit and then I'm good, right? Yeah, you could. You could do that. You could. you could. You could sit at home and read your Bible and you have the Holy Spirit. But, you know, the Bible says in Hebrews 10 that, that we're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together as a manner of, so, uh, of some is. But to, um, you know, we're supposed to come and to exhort one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. And that there is, you know, church is important. I'm not going to get into that. I've, I've preached on that multiple times, even just recently. You could read Ephesians uh, chapter 4. You could read other places in Scripture where God has ordained men to be pastors and teachers and, um, you know, for the perfecting of the saints and, and that we wouldn't just be as children tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. Now, um, Moses actually experienced this type of attack a lot in his lifetime. This isn't one unique event. Uh, I'm going to read just for you. Turn or stay in Numbers chapter 16. We're going to go through most of this. But even in Acts chapter 7, when, when the martyr Stephen is kind of preaching that great sermon that right before he got stoned to death, he brings up Moses because... He's basically confronting the Pharisees and the wicked false prophets of his day that you're basically the same as everybody who rebelled against Moses. And the, but see, those people claim to believe in Moses. They, they're like, no, we believe in, you know, the Pharisees, we believe in Moses' law. You know, I don't know about this Jesus guy, but we believe in Moses. 
And as he's preaching to them about Moses and how the people were like, well, who made you a ruler over us? Who made you a judge? He brings up the story of when Moses was, was beginning to lead and he was going to start leading how he saw an Egyptian beating a, a, a Hebrew. And he ended up killing the Egyptian man. And then the next day he sees two Hebrews fighting and he's like, tries to split up the fight. And the one guy's like, you know, who do you think you are? Who made you a ruler and a judge over us? Are you going to kill me like you killed the Egyptian? And when Stephen's recounting this story, he says in Acts 7.35, he says, This Moses whom they refused, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge? Right? That's what they're saying. Who are, you to, who are you to be the ruler? Who made you the judge? Stephen said, The same did God send to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel which appeared to him in the bush. He's saying, yeah, they're saying, well, who made you a ruler? Who, who do you think you are? Well, you know what? God's the one who sent him. God's the one who ordained him. And yes, God did ordain him to be a ruler and a judge. Right. Just because some people don't want to accept that or, or don't want to admit that or whatever, don't have anything to do with it, it doesn't change the fact that God did send him to be a ruler. But what I love about Moses especially the Bible refers to Moses as, as a very meek man and, and very humble and the most meek man on the earth at that time. When they confront Moses saying, you're lifting yourself up. Who do you think you are? What does he do? Look at verse number four. It says, when Moses heard it, he fell upon his face. He fell upon his face. Basically showing, hey, it's not me, I'm nobody, but at the same time, we're going to see what he says because he doesn't just back down. When, when the bullies come and try to push their way in and try to take over, he doesn't back down. Now, he's humble. He's meek. He shows humility and falls down on his face, basically that he's nobody, but at the same time, he's not going to back down because he has a job to do. Because God did ordain him to do a job. Just because the opposition comes and try to tell him, well, who do you think you are? He's not just going to back down and just say, oh, okay, well, you, you go ahead and lead everybody then. He is not going to do that. He ought to obey God rather than men. Now he falls down upon his face. He shows humility. But in verse number five, it says, and he spake unto Korah and to all his company, saying, even tomorrow the Lord will show who are his and who is holy. And will cause him to come near unto him. Even him whom he hath chosen will he cause to come near unto him. So he says, okay, we can settle this real quick. We'll just let God decide. I mean, he already has, but, but we'll just have God show you what's right and what's wrong. Verse number six. And this is what I love about this too, is that, you know, they, they go to Moses basically like, who do you think you are leading and ruling? And then even in this situation, Moses is telling them all what to do. Okay, here's what you're going to do. You go get some incense. You show up tomorrow. You, you, know, you all gather together. It's like, why didn't they come up with any ideas? Like, how are we going to determine who should be leading? Well, you know what? Moses tells them exactly how it's going to be done. Verse number six, this do, take you censers, Korah and all his company, and put fire therein, and put incense in them before the Lord tomorrow. And it shall be that the man whom the Lord doth choose, he shall be holy Ye take too much upon you, ye sons of Levi. So he turns it back around on them because they're trying to say, oh, you're taking too much upon yourself, Moses. He's saying, no, no, you take too much upon you. And that's the title of my sermon this morning. You take too much upon you. And this is a warning because I think in, in this case, you know, Korah is a false prophet. There's no doubt in my mind about that. He's out to divide He's pitting people against Moses and Aaron. He's mentioned in the book of Jude among all the other false prophets and the teaching against false prophets. But we need to be careful of the proud attitude. Even as a believer, Amen. it's good to have, be, to have zeal. It's good to be zealous. It's good to desire the office of a bishop, for example. It's good to want to do more work. It's good to do as much as you can. But just be careful that you don't get to a place where your attitude is disdaining of God-ordained leadership that 
preaching the right gospel, you know, doing a good work, and where people start to think, oh, I know better than him. I know more than him. This is something that I've found is actually a really, um, just, just a really bad spot for people kind of new coming into our type of movement where they're hearing a lot of preaching. Maybe they haven't heard a lot of preaching before. They haven't, they haven't learned a lot from the Bible. And now all of a sudden they're listening to all these sermons on the internet and they're getting all kinds of, of knowledge handed to them real quickly. And hey, that can be a good thing. But what I've heard too many times is, you know, people are going to different churches. But soul winning churches, people were, you know, they're doing a good work. Yeah, maybe they have some different doctrines. Yeah, they're, they have different beliefs when it comes to end times or on just whatever, different issues. But they're good people and it's a good church and they're doing a good work. And I hear people saying, oh, I know more than that pastor knows. Pfft, who does he think he is? You know, he doesn't even know this. And it's like, well, what did you know? You, you know, what do you know that you haven't received? That's what the Apostle Paul says, you know. How can you glory and boast of these things? Anything you've learned, you've learned from somebody else. Even the Apostle Paul himself, he's been given these mysteries. You know what? He didn't just come up with that stuff on his own. It was given to him by God. So how can you glory over something that you didn't do yourself? And this is a trap for novices. This is a trap for people who are not rooted and grounded and do not have humility down and meekness down. Because you want to think that you're so much better than someone else. Watch out for that wicked heart and that wicked attitude. Let's keep reading here in number 16. Verse number 8, the Bible says, And Moses said unto Korah, Here I pray you, ye sons of Levi. And notice, up to this point, Moses is only addressing Korah. Dathan and Byram didn't even come. Now, they're all pitted against Moses. They're all working together against Moses, against Aaron. But still, up to this point, Moses is just dealing with Korah. I think Korah is kind of heading the charge. Korah is the Levite. Korah is the one just trying to be like, well, hey, why can't we do the priest job? Why can't we do what you do, Moses and Aaron? Verse number nine, seemeth it but a small thing unto you that the God of Israel has separated you from the congregation of Israel to bring you near to himself, to do the service of the tabernacle of the Lord and to stand before the congregation and minister unto them? And he hath brought thee near to him and all thy brethren, the sons of Levi, with thee and seek ye the priesthood also? Moses is rebuking him here. Saying, you think it's just a small thing? That God has already separated you to do service in the, for the Lord. To do service in the tabernacle that the rest of the tribes weren't able to do. And now you're just treating that as if it's nothing. You already have an important job. You already have this position of being able to minister that needs to be performed, that needs to be done, and that's not good enough for you. You need to have someone else's job. And that is a covetous attitude and a wicked heart. Amen. That's right. We need to, be, to learn to be content with where God has us and not so anxious to take too much upon ourselves thinking that, that we're going to, you know, because what, what is he doing here? He's accusing Moses and Aaron of lifting up themselves above the congregation. But what's he trying to do? He's trying to lift himself up above the congregation. Korah's trying to put himself in the position to be the leader. He's coveting Moses' job. See, Moses didn't lift himself up. And another indicator of the false prophet, watch out for the guy that wants to prop himself up, that wants to lift himself up over a congregation, over a people, maybe have a church split and say, hey, no, I'm going to be a leader over here now and you all can follow me. Watch out for that person, that non-ordained person that's out causing trouble, pitting people against one another, pitting people against men of God, pitting people about, about, against people who are trying to do a good work. Watch out for that. 
People who are out serving the Lord, we don't need to be against those people at all. We shouldn't be against those people. Jesus taught this when the apostles were out and they say, hey, we saw someone casting out devils and we, you know, they didn't follow us. So we told them not to do it anymore. I'm paraphrasing. And Jesus said, forbid them not. Forbid them not. They're out doing a good work. He said, you know, people doing that, they can't speak, they can't likely speak evil against me. They may not be exactly with you, but if they're good people, they're, you know, and when I say good, I mean they're born again, they're serving the Lord, you know, they, they've got their fundamentals down and, and you know, they're, they're winning souls or whatever. Then praise God for that. Why would we want to cause strife and division and, and, and make things to cease with that? We don't, but the wicked person does and the false prophet does want to stop that and they'll stand up and rebel against all of those things. Now, Let's continue here. Verse number 11, the Bible says, For which cause both thou and all thy company are gathered together against the Lord? And what is Aaron that you murmur against him? And this is, Moses just, just spells it out here. They're not coming against just Moses and Aaron. They're going against the Lord. They're going against God's word. It's not just about Moses and Aaron. He's saying, why are you coming up and you're gathered together against the Lord? He's saying, what is Aaron? You're murmuring. Murmuring is complaining. Complaining about Moses. Complaining about Aaron. They don't like the job they're doing. He's like, you're just coming up against the Lord. It has nothing to do with Moses or Aaron. Now, we're going to switch gears here. Dathan and Byram were not Levites. So he calls for them to come and, and to confront the issue. Okay. Dealt with Korah. Got him coming to, to bring his incense and stuff and, and instructed him that God's going to decide who's going to be the one that should be the priest and who's going to lead. And then he calls for Dathan and Byram, and they don't come. They just don't even show up. Verse number 12, And Moses sent to call Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, which said, We will not come up. Is it a small thing that thou hast brought us up out of a land that floweth with milk and honey to kill us in the wilderness, except thou make thyself altogether a prince over us? What a misrepresentation of the truth. Look at it. He says, Is it a small thing that thou hast brought us up out of a land that floweth with milk and honey? He brought them up out of Egypt where they were slaves. They were in bondage. They were being persecuted. Oh, you brought us out of this great land. I mean, it flowed with milk and honey. We had everything so good, and now you've just brought us out into this wilderness so that you could rule over us. No, Moses was leading them into a land that flowed with milk and honey. He was leading them into the promised land, into a good place, but because of their wicked hearts and because of their wicked attitude and because of their unbelief, God forced them to wander in the wilderness until that generation died off. They have been fighting against God the whole time. People like Korah and Dathan and Abiram. Verse number 14. Moreover, thou hast not brought us into a land that floweth with milk and honey, or given us inheritance of fields and vineyards. Wilt thou put out the eyes of these men? We will not come up. And Moses was very wroth and said unto the Lord, Respect not thou their offering. I have not taken one ass from them, neither have I hurt one of them. And Moses said unto Korah, Be thou and the, all thy company before the Lord, thou and they and Aaron tomorrow. And take every man his censer and put incense in them, and bring ye before the Lord every man his censer, 250 censers, thou also and Aaron, each of you his censer. And they took every man a censer and put fire in them and laid incense thereon and stood in the door of the tabernacle of the congregation with Moses and Aaron. And Korah gathered all the congregation against them unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation and the glory of the Lord appeared unto all the congregation. So Korah has got everybody against Moses and Aaron. Everybody's against him. And as I mentioned in the beginning, I want, I want you to pay attention to this. We're going to make a, a very 
solid point on this chapter because we're going to see the heart that Moses has for the people at large, even the people that are against him at this point. But we're also going to see his heart towards the wicked people and how there is no contradiction here, but when it comes to the false prophet, when it comes to the wicked reprobate person, Moses told, was, was praying to God, telling them, don't respect their offering. I didn't do anything to these people. Don't respect, don't accept them, Lord. We're going to see even further. Look at verse number 20. The Bible says, And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, Separate yourselves from among this congregation, that I may consume them in a moment. God is, is fed up with these people that are just following these wicked people and have completely gone against Moses and Aaron and the Lord. And he says, you know what? Just, just you guys separate yourselves because I'm about to destroy everybody. And we'll just start over. We'll start from scratch. And this isn't the first time that God has said this to Moses. That's right. That's right. This has happened multiple times. We'll get into a little bit after we have time. But um, so God says, you know what? Just, just get away from them. I'm going to destroy everybody. But look what they do. Look what Moses and Aaron do. Verse 22. And they fell upon their faces and said, oh, God. The God of the spirits of all flesh shall one man sin and wilt thou be wroth with all the congregation? Now, that is not an easy thing to say when everybody is against you. Put yourself in their shoes. Now, yes, it's true. You have Korah is pitting everybody against them, the whole congregation. But you got the whole congregation against you now. Part of you and your flesh is going to be like, well, you know what? If you're going to be that stupid, then yeah, God, just go ahead and just destroy him. But that's not the spirit that Moses and Aaron had. But we're going to look at the difference between how they felt towards Korah and Dathan and Byram and how they feel towards just all the rest of the congregation at large. Because it's not like the whole congregation were all false prophets. They were deceived by the deceivers. There's a difference in how a godly attitude towards a deceiver is versus the deceived. Let's keep reading. Verse 23, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the congregation, saying, Get you up from about the tabernacle of Korah, Dathan, and Byram. So now God hearkens unto him. He listens, and he says, Okay, well now tell the congregation to just separate themselves from Korah, Dathan, and Byram. And Moses rose up and went unto Dathan and Byram, and the elders of Israel followed him. And he spake unto the congregation, saying, Depart, I pray you, from the tents of these wicked men, and touch nothing of theirs, lest ye be consumed in all their sins. So notice, Moses didn't try to intercede for Korah, Dathan, and Byram. They interceded for the congregation, but not for these wicked men. So he comes up and warns the congregation, said, Get away from these wicked men or else you're going to be consumed in all their sins. Verse 27, So they got up from the tabernacle of Korah, Dathan, and Byram on every side. And it, isn't it just interesting, the power that the man of God has here, Moses has, the people are still listening to him. They're pitted against them, but when Moses comes in, I mean, he's boldly telling them what to do, and they still listen to him. Amen. That's the power of God right there. So they got up from the tabernacle of Korah, Dathan, and Byram on every side. And Dathan and Byram came out and stood in the door of their tents and their wives and their sons and their little children. And Moses said, Hereby ye shall know that the Lord hath sent me to do all these works, for I have not done them of mine own mind. He's saying, this, this isn't my thing. I, this is, I'm not doing all this stuff because I'm some cult leader just trying to control everybody in the wilderness. I didn't just do this of my own. Verse 29, If these men die the common death of all men, or if they be visited after the visitation of all men, then the Lord hath not sent me. Say, okay. If these guys just continue, they live to however long, and then they just die of natural causes, or however normally people die, God didn't send me. This is how you're going to know. But, verse 30, But if the Lord make a new thing, and the earth open, uh, open her mouth and swallow them up with all that appertain unto them. And they go down quick into the pit. 
Then ye shall understand that these men have provoked the Lord. And I don't know how much clearer he could make this to the people saying, look, if God opens up the earth and they go straight to hell, then this should show you that these people provoked God to anger. It's not Moses using some magical powers to open up the earth as if he's doing this. He's saying, look, if God does this, then you could just know that they provoke the Lord. And you can know that, that God has sent me because he's pronouncing this stuff, but God's the one doing it, and it's happening to these wicked people. Pretty easy to, I mean, I don't, it, it blows my mind, their response, when this actually happens. Look at verse 31. And it came to pass, as he had made an end of speaking all these words, that the ground clave asunder that was under them, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up and their houses and all the men that appertained in the core and all their goods. They and all that appertained to them went down alive into the pit and the earth closed upon them. And they perished from among the congregation and all Israel that were round about them fled at the cry of them. For they said, lest the earth swallow us up also. And there came out a fire from the Lord and consumed the 250 men that offered incense. So not only... Did the earth open up? But then the other 250 men, remember, because they gathered all these princes and all these people against Moses and Aaron, they all died too. The fire just came out and, went, <laughs> and killed all of those people, but from what we gather, only those people. Amen. God didn't, didn't go out and kill the rest of the congregation at all. It was very specific on who ended up dying. Jump down to verse number 41 because this is, this is insanity to me, but this shows you the power and the influence that these people had. They're all dead. The people who were pitting the congregation against Moses and Aaron, they're dead. It's been proven that they're striving against the Lord, but they had won over the hearts of the congregation so effectively, verse number 41, the Bible says, But on the morrow, so the next day, all the congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses, against Aaron, saying, Ye have killed the people of the Lord. You've killed God's people. Oh, man. No. <laughs> They're not God's people. That's why God opened up the earth and sent them straight to hell. But, but they're so convinced that, that, that Korah and Dathan and Byron, oh, they're people of the Lord. That they actually go and they're murmuring and they're complaining against Moses and against Aaron. Verse 42, and it came to pass when the congregation was gathered against Moses and against Aaron that they looked toward the tabernacle of the congregation and behold, the cloud covered it and the glory of the Lord appeared. And Moses and Aaron came before the tabernacle of the congregation and the Lord spake unto Moses saying, get you up from among this congregation that I may consume them as in a moment. So again, God's saying, I've had it with these people. Just, just separate yourselves from them, and I'm just going to consume them. And they fell upon their faces. So again, this is the exact same thing they did the first time. Moses and Aaron, they fall on their faces. They humble themselves before God, and they're trying to intercede for the people. These people have been deceived. They're not the deceivers. So here's what they do. They actually go into action. Look at verse 46. And Moses said unto Aaron, Take a censer and put fire therein from off the altar and put on incense and go quickly unto the congregation and make an atonement for them. Go make things right for them. Go make this atonement, make this sacrifice, bring this incense and offer it up unto the Lord for them. For there is wrath gone out from the Lord and the plague is begun. And Aaron took as Moses commanded and ran into the midst of the congregation, the midst of the congregation that was complaining and murmuring against him, the midst of the congregation that wanted to have nothing to do with Aaron and Moses because they were deceived. He runs into the midst of this congregation and behold, the plague was begun among the people, and he put on incense and made an atonement for the people. They loved the people. 
They loved the people enough to do whatever they could possibly do to try to save them. Save them from the wrath of God. The wrath of God was abiding on these people. And he was ready to pour out his wrath. But because of their love for the people, they went in to save them from that wrath. What a great picture of soul winning. What a great picture of the heart and the mind that we ought to have for the lost. For people that might be against you right now. People who currently want to have nothing to do with you right now. Because they've been deceived. They've been led astray. Some wicked false prophet has polluted their mind. The, the God of this world has blinded their eyes. But the real men of God, they love those people. They don't want to see those people perish. Amen. Amen. So what we're going to do, instead of running away from them, instead of just saying, well, they could all just go to hell then, they're saying, no, let's go and try to save them. Amen. Verse 48, and he stood between the dead and the living and the plague was stayed. He got right up to the front line and offered up that incense and made the atonement. It says in verse 49, Now they that died in the plague were 14,700 beside them that died about the matter of Korah. And Aaron returned unto Moses under the door of the tabernacle of the congregation and the plague was stayed. This truly is the sign of a great leader. It wasn't about them. It wasn't about Moses and Aaron. It wasn't about their fame. It was a love for the people. They cared about the people. It was a burden to take on that job. It wasn't fun for Moses and Aaron to be leading this people, especially the people that were so easily deceived and swayed and pitted against them and everything else, but they actually did care about them. And this is just one more illustration, just one more truth from God's word, how there's a difference between the false prophet reprobate yeah, send that person to hell. God, open up the earth and just let them go to hell now so they can stop deceiving people and stop their wicked work. Amen. These children of the devil, just kill them off now and they can just go to hell now. And we see that throughout Scripture. That is biblical. But everybody else, we love them. We don't want to see them perish. We want to do what we can. Yeah, some of them are going to die. Some people died in the plague. You couldn't get to all of them. But we're going to do what we can to bring these people who have been deceived the light, to bring them the truth, to bring them the gospel, whether they hate us or not. It's not the easiest job. It's not the most fun job, but it's what the man of God is supposed to do. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 9. I'm going to close with this. We've got a little bit of time. Deuteronomy chapter 9. We're just going to read through a lot of this passage because it kind of summarizes how the children of Israel were just continually complaining against Moses. And I, I can't emphasize this enough, the heart that Moses had. Because at any given time, if you put yourself in his shoes, it could be so easy to just throw up your hands and just say, well, forget it. Okay, if these people don't want to hear it, then forget it. I'm done. And there came a point with, with Moses, even he hit his breaking point when there's too much complaining going on. He just says, God, you know, I didn't give birth to all these people and, and you know, I can't handle this anymore. And if you could just kill me, Lord, then that would be great. And again, I'm paraphrasing, but this is the attitude that Moses had. Where he's just like, I can't do this anymore. Because it is so difficult. It's hard enough. 
It's hard enough being around complainers, right? Just one person. You got that kid that doesn't want to eat their dinner and they don't, oh, I don't want to, I don't like that. And then, you know, nothing seems to satisfy them, right? That's annoying. You don't want to hear, especially as the mom that, that prepares the meal or dad that works and, and provides the food to eat that meal. And you're like, you're going to eat that meal. It's good for you. We got that because we love you. We spent the time and you don't even understand what we're doing for you. You don't want to hear the complaining. But especially with your own children, you love your children. I mean, of course you love your children. It's a lot easier to deal with that with your own family. So let's think about more extended then. You invite people over, you have guests or whoever, you throw over, and then you hear some complaining about something. It's like, I take out the time to do this and I spend this money on this and, and I'm going to hear a complaint about that. Well, you start my thinking, well, I might just not invite you back again. Right? I mean, that's just the way, the way that we are. You, know, you don't want to deal with that because you don't want to hear a complaint. Think about Moses. Moses was leading an entire nation of people that were complaining against him. There's a lot of people. It's hard to understand what he was going through because nobody has had that, like nobody here, I haven't even had that much hate and complaining. I mean, I've had a little bit, just emails and things like that, but no, nowhere close. I mean, Moses was dealing with this huge group of people and they're all complaining, oh man, we had it so good in Egypt. You were slaves. What do you mean you had it so good in Egypt? I mean, just complain about everything. Oh, this manna. It's a miracle from God that you're eating this food in the wilderness. You don't even have to work for it. You just pick it up and eat it. And you're going to complain about that. You're going to complain about not having food. You're going to complain about having to move around. With, look, stop complaining. Be content with what you have. But that complaining makes you want to kill yourself. And it was that complaining that made Moses want to die. But the steadfastness of Moses and the heart that he had for people kept him going. Whether they were for him or against him, he still tried to do his job to the best of his ability. Let's read through a little bit of this summary in, in Deuteronomy chapter 9. We're going to start reading in verse number 7. The Bible says, Remember and forget not how thou provokest the Lord thy God to wrath in the wilderness. From the day that thou didst depart out of the land of Egypt until you came unto this place, ye have been rebellious against the Lord. Also in Horeb, you provoked the Lord to wrath, so that the Lord was angry with you to have destroyed you. When I was gone up into the mount to receive the tables of stone, even the tables of the covenant, which the Lord made with you, then I abode in the mount forty days and forty nights. I neither did eat bread nor drink water. And the Lord delivered unto me two tables of stone written with the finger of God. And on them was written according to all the words which the Lord spake with you in the mount, out of the midst of the fire in the day of the assembly. And it came to pass at the end of 40 and days and 40 nights that the Lord gave me the two tables of stone, even the tables of the covenant. And the Lord said unto me, Arise, get thee down quickly from hence, for the, thy people, which thou hast brought forth out of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. They are quickly turned aside out of the way which I commanded them. They have made them a molten image." Furthermore, the Lord spake unto me, saying, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Let me alone, that I may destroy them, and blot out their name from under heaven. And I will make of thee a nation mightier and greater than they. So not only was Moses, you know, told multiple times, we already saw in this story, hey, separate yourself, I'm just going to destroy them. Not only is he told, you know, that okay, we're going we're gonna to get rid of these people or wipe them out. God's telling them, I'll just bring up a whole new nation, a whole new uh, people that's going to be mightier and greater. greater. Like, like, he has this extra incentive, if he wanted to, to take this other plan. Okay, let's build a greater nation. Yeah, that sounds good right about now. But that means all of those people dying and being wiped out. And Moses wouldn't do it. He says, no, let's just work with these people. Verse 15, so I turned and came down from the mount, and the mount burned with fire, and the two tables of the covenant were in my two hands. And I looked, and behold, 
ye had sinned against the Lord your God and had made you a molten calf. Ye had turned aside quickly out of the way which the Lord had commanded you. And I took the two tables and cast them out of my two hands and break them before your eyes. And I fell down before the Lord as at the first. Forty days and forty nights I did neither eat bread nor drink water because of all your sins which ye sinned in doing wickedly in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. Two times Moses fasted for forty days and forty nights not having bread or water. God sustained him. I don't recommend taking on a fast of 40 days and 40 nights without bread or water, but Moses did this. And, he's, and while these people are just like, oh, we don't know where Moses is, we're just going to forget. He's fasting and praying and meeting with God for 40 days and 40 nights, working really hard, and they're just like, well, whatever, he's gone. I don't, you know. it's, it's the people that come into church, okay, feed me, I'm here, you know, you don't realize all the work and everything and the preparation, everything that goes into it behind the scenes. And people just come in. It's like, well, whatever. We're just going to go. We don't care. And, you know, come in, serve me, do this and that for me. And then, and then you're off and gone. And then you're going to complain if, you know, you don't have the, the prayer challenge prizes. <laughs> Nobody's done that. <laughs> We're just going to complain about whatever, right? You haven't painted the walls yet. Come on, what's wrong? But it's, it's the same type, it's a similar type of an attitude, right? Obviously, I'm making kind of fun here where we're at, but um, think about all the work that Moses is putting in. I mean, 40 days and 40 nights praying, spending time with God, and these people are just so quick to just, well, yeah, we saw all those miracles and stuff, but uh, we're ready to move on. We don't want to wait that long. And then... Um, he comes down and he sees all the sin that they got into. They, they made an idol. They were naked. Like how fast do you go from serving the Lord to just being naked and partying and, and having idolatry? And Moses still falls on his face and he says, you know what? I'm going to fast again. And he fasts and prays and intercedes for the people that God doesn't destroy them. Verse 19, For I was afraid of the anger and hot displeasure wherewith the Lord was wroth against you to destroy you, but the Lord hearkened unto me at that time also. And the Lord was very angry with Aaron to have destroyed him. And I prayed for Aaron also the same time. Even Aaron and Miriam came up against Moses. Moses had a lot to deal with. He had a lot of problems and he still is praying for all of these people. Verse 21, And I took your sin, the calf which ye had made, and burnt it with fire, and stamped it, and ground it very small, even until it was as small as dust. And I cast the dust thereof into the brook that descended out of the mount, and at Tabra, and at Massa, and at Kibroth Hadavah, ye provoked the Lord to wrath. And he's bringing, he, Tabra, Massa, Kibroth Hadavah. You continue to provoke the Lord to wrath, to anger. Likewise, when the Lord sent you from Kadesh Barnea, saying, Go up and possess the land which I have given you, then you rebelled against the commandment of the Lord your God, and you believed him not, nor hearkened to his voice. Ye have been rebellious against the Lord from the day that I knew you. Thus I fell down before the Lord forty days and forty nights, as I fell down at the first, because the Lord had said he would destroy you. I prayed therefore unto the Lord and said, O Lord God, destroy not thy people and thine inheritance, which thou hast redeemed through thy greatness, which thou hast brought forth out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Remember thy servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Look not unto the stubbornness of this people, nor to their wickedness, nor to their sin. Lest the land, once you brought us, us out, say, because the Lord was not able to bring them into the land which he promised them, and because he hated them, he hath brought them out to slay them in the wilderness." Yet they are thy people and thine inheritance, which thou broughtest out by thy mighty power and by thy stretched out arm. This is the attitude that we ought to have. And not worry about what people think about you. Not worry about, um, you know, even people not loving you. The Apostle Paul said uh, in, to the church at Corinth, if you're familiar with, with the first and second Corinthians, there's a lot of problems at the church in Corinth and Paul's constantly correcting them. And there's people there that are speaking bad about the apostle Paul and, and, and not having any respect for him and wanting to lift up themselves within the congregation. 
And the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians 12, 14, Behold, the third time I am ready to come to you, and I will not be burdensome to you, for I seek not yours, but you. For the children ought not to lay up for the parents, but the parents for the children. He's treating them as children. He's saying, look, I didn't come for your stuff. I come for you because I care about you. And he's saying, you know, you don't need to lay up for me. The parents are going to lay up for the children. I'm going to lay up for you. I love you. I care about you. He says, and I will very gladly spend and be spent for you. I will very gladly give of myself and spend and invest the time and completely devote myself to you because I love you. He says, though the more abundantly I love you, the less I be loved. And if you want to get involved in ministry, be prepared to handle that. Just be ready for that because it's a fact. It happens. You can end up doing all kinds of things for people and they'll turn around and stab you in the back. They won't respect what you've done. They won't care about what you've done. You try to help them. You try to give people the truth. You try to do whatever you possibly can to help that person because you love them. This is the life of ministry. You have to be able to get through that. Look at what Moses had to deal with. Yet he was extremely successful. Why? He didn't quit. He loved the people. Look at all the people that, you know, physically he saved. Not just physically, but spiritually, but even just physically. God is ready to kill people. And Moses stepped in and said, no, please don't. And, and interceded for them. Giving us the illustration, the example of the heart and the attitude. That's obviously the heart that Jesus Christ has. That's the heart that we need to have in our life in our Christian life, especially going out, seeking these people. They're not seeking us. We need to bring the truth of the gospel to them and get the wrath of God that is abiding on the unsaved world. Get that off of them. Amen. Lead them to Christ so that they can put their faith in the Lord and get saved. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for all these stories in the Bible that we could learn from. God, I pray that you would please just uh, help us all to be able to walk in the Spirit and not in our flesh. Lord, help us not to have a bitter heart towards people that maybe have burned us in the past, but that are, that are not the, the wicked, reprobate, false teachers like Kor, Dathan, and Byram. Lord, I pray that you would please just help us to, um, to have more of a loving heart and spirit and help us to go out and be strong, be strengthened, uh, by one another and especially through you and through your word through the holy ghost dear god help us to to be strong enough to go out and do the work that's set before us and it's in jesus christ's name we pray amen